Shalom from Israel. It is good to be with everybody tonight. I'm Ron Cantor, the president of Shalom TV. I'm also the director of Messiah's Mandate. And um, I want to talk about genocide. I want to talk about today's hearing at the ICJ, that's the International Court of Justice, where South Africa and South African lawyers accused Israel of deliberately committing genocide. Now, they took three hours to make their case. I'm not going to take that long to uh, combat their case or to give a rebuttal, a response. Um, but I do hope you'll watch this. I do hope you'll listen because there is that proverb that says the first to bring their case seems right until another comes forth. Now, listen, I'm not a lawyer. I don't have the training that they have. I haven't prepared like they have. So the fact that I'm going to make a case that really does, I think, combat there, shows how weak their case is. They're smarter than me. They're more educated than me. They got law degrees. Some of them wear wigs. I have no wig. I wish I, if I had a wig, I would wear it because then I would look very judicial. But in lieu of a wig, I'm just going to make some arguments. And I want to start with point number one. What is genocide? According to the Google, Genocide is the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. Okay, I am not going to deny that the past three months have been horrific for the people of Gaza. Obviously, we can't separate that from October 7th. But, but still, if you are an innocent person in Gaza, in in you find yourself in the middle of the war. It's horrific. I, I understand that people, uh, they need food. They need medicine. I don't blame Israel. I blame Hamas. But, but let's just talk about what has happened in Gaza. So genocide. If Israel is committing genocide, it means that our goal is to do, first of all, Gaza is not a nation, but let's just pretend like it is. Let's pretend like Gaza is a nation. And our goal, if we're going to commit genocide, would be to to destroy that nation, to get rid of it completely. So it means we'd have to kill everybody there or move them to other nations. Now, if that is our goal, we're not doing a very good job. Let's go back to 1948. As I understand it, in 1948, when Israel became a nation, there was roughly 60 to 80,000 Arabs in the Gaza area, which by the way, was for 20 years controlled by Egypt, not Israel. Until 1967, it was controlled by Egypt. And we won't even get into all that, how the Egyptians treated them, but they didn't treat them well. Um, today, fast forward to 2024, there are 2.3 million Arabs in Gaza. So roughly 70,000 back 1948, now it is, what, 30, 40 times that at 2.3 million. That would be the, the vast opposite of genocide. And you, you say, well, Ben and Ron, we're, we're just talking about what you've done since October 7th. Well, that's not what the guys from South Africa said, as we're going to get into a minute. They, they said this, this catastrophe, this Nakba that we've brought upon the people of Gaza began in 1948. But we're, I, I'm not even, I don't want to go there yet. Let's, let's talk about that. Since October 7th, or let's say October 8th, uh, according to Hamas, 23, 24,000 Gazans have died. And let me remind you, that number has remained has only risen slightly in the past month, which means that most of the people that died, died in the initial bombing. Again, and I'm not celebrating that. I'm not happy about that. I wish that there was peace between the people of Gaza and the people of Israel. They don't want that. They have not wanted that. Their leadership has not wanted that. We left Gaza in 2005 and they sent rockets. They've sent rockets for 18 years, 19 years. We wanted peace. That's why we left. And we didn't want to protect 10,000 Israelis in the midst of 2 million Arabs. We didn't feel that that was very fair or very safe for our soldiers. So the fact is, uh, in, in the bombing that has taken place, if we were trying to commit genocide, if we were trying to destroy, and by the way, our prime minister, other ministers in the government have said very clearly, we are not trying to displace the, the, the people of Gaza. Yes, there are some irresponsible voices in our government, just like in every government saying dumb stuff. 
Uh, but in terms of official policy, the official policy is to keep the people of Gaza in Gaza. That is official Israeli policy from the war cabinet. Now, if we were trying to commit genocide, again, I'm not happy that 24,000 Gazans have died. It's, 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 it's heartbreaking. It is very sad that Hamas has led them to this. Instead, over this past 20 years, since we left Gaza, Hamas has done nothing to help Gaza. They've done nothing to build an infrastructure. They've done nothing to build an economy. All they have focused on is building tunnels, in bringing in missiles, shooting rockets at Israel. They have done nothing to help the people of Gaza. But if we are trying to commit genocide from October 8th until now, we have the firepower. We could have turned Gaza into a parking lot if that was our goal. But it's not our goal. What we, what we are trying to do, and by the way, if not for the massive bombing in the beginning of this war, 130 hostages would still be in Gaza. And, and, and let me just be clear. There are women in Gaza t today, Israeli Jewish women, who might be pregnant from being raped on October 7th. I am told, and I'm not going to say who told me, but I have been told by people who know that there are women who came back from Gaza pregnant by terrorists. That's what they did to our people on October 7th. Without the bombing that took place on October 8th until the release of the hostages, those, those, those women, those girls, they would still be there under Hamas authority underground in tunnels so nobody's happy about bombing gaza there's no i have listen i've been with soldiers for the past uh, uh since we got here on october 13th uh we were in france on the day that the war began but we got back as soon as we could and we have been with soldiers constantly and i have not yet one time heard one soldier talk about the joys of bombing gaza the joys of, of committing genocide or killing arabs so Genocide is when you deliberately try to destroy Hitler. Now that's genocide. You had 9 to 11 million Jews in Europe and he killed 6 million. Now we didn't have a nation at that time, but he tried to destroy every, that, that's genocide. Do you understand? Um, and by the way, South Africa, looking for my glasses, by the way, South Africa, and I know not everybody in South Africa agrees with what their government's doing, but so I'm speaking to the government. Um, why doesn't it bother you when Bashar Assad kills half a million Arabs, including thousands of Palestinians in refugee camps, destroyed his own country, committed self-genocide, used biological weapons against children? There is video of the children vomiting and dying because of the biological weapons that he used. Why? Did you not bring sanctions or take him to the international court? And, and listen, excuse me, I'm sorry, but what about America? I am American. You know, when we took out Saddam Hussein, uh, an estimated 100,000 Iraqis died. What about Putin? Did it bother you when Putin invaded Ukraine without cause? and begin to send rockets and missiles on train stations, on apartment buildings? Why is your outrage so selective? Could it be that you just don't like Jewish people? That you hate the state of Israel? I'm going to say yes, it could be that. Okay, I've got a few points that I want to make here. Make here. Um, uh, so number one, no, it was not genocide because genocide, would, if, if that was our goal, it would have been done already. They're growing in Gaza. They're not getting smaller. Um, number two, their presentation was unbelievably one-sided. They played videotapes that, you know, of the destruction in Gaza. And, and again, nobody's happy about that. But why didn't they play video? They did mention Hamas only to say that what Hamas did on October 7th didn't start on October 7th. And, and if I'm honest, they did very ever so briefly, you might have to watch it a few times, but they did condemn Hamas's actions on October 7th, only because you can't really talk about Israel's response without, but they, then they spent three hours talking about Israel. They could have played tapes 
video uh, uh, recordings of Hamas, uh, uh, of them killing. I've seen it. I have seen the footage. I was in Jerusalem. I watched the 45-minute uh, recording. I saw a man killed, murdered, shot in front of his two sons. I saw the terrorists rejoicing. By the way, they did play videotapes of, uh, of the uh, Israeli soldiers being encouraged by their leaders, uh, but they didn't play any of the recordings of the Hamas terrorists screaming, yellow, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, as they killed Israelis. They didn't talk about the Israeli women who were raped. They didn't talk about the Israeli women who, like I said earlier, may right now be pregnant with the child of a terrorist. Because that's what happens sometimes when you get raped. They didn't talk about any of that. I can watch uh, the, the, the Israeli news, I-24 news, and they're regularly showing the tapes that Israel got off of the GoPro cameras, off of the terrorist surveillance tapes, of them rejoicing and being happy. I watched yesterday as a terrorist, after he killed Jews, he was shot himself. And as he's dying, uh, he's saying um, in, in Arabic, um, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet and then he dies. That, those were his last words. Like in his mind, he's, he's performing a religious duty by killing, by maiming, by pillaging. But they didn't mention any of that. They didn't talk about the rape where there is tons and tons of evidence. They didn't talk about... Now again, I didn't watch all three hours but I'm pretty sure they did. And I watched a lot of it. Um... Uh, it was completely one-sided, and any mention of Hamas was to say you can't blame Hamas for what's happening, uh, for what Israel is doing. But you can, actually, you can, South Africa, because let's just pretend that you had a country like Zimbabwe or, or Zambia on your border, and they decided to send 3,000 terrorists into your country, and they killed 1,200 of your people, and they kidnapped nearly 300 of your citizens, and they raped your women and... Girls, that's right, teenage girls were raped and then they were murdered. There is forensic evidence of an eyewitness testimony of teenage girls being raped by grown men, religious men, who supposedly religious, nuts, savages, barbarians. It was completely one-sided. And then there was one fellow, I'm going to play for you a little clip for him right now. Okay, so he's referring to Israel as a co co colonial power and the ongoing Nakba, which means catastrophe, that began. It's the Arab word, by the way. For So it's nice that a guy from South Africa... It, it, and by the way, if you want to know South Africa's motivation, it was in that clip right there. Right there, he is basically saying, we are taking the position that the state of Israel is illegal. In other words, it would appear that he is actually for genocide. He seems to want to get rid of the state of Israel. He is at least saying that what we did in 1948 when we established, reestablished the nation of Israel was illegal, was a nakba, was a catastrophe for the, the people here. That is absolute nonsense. And yes, I am getting angry because you should know better. You are a smart individual. You have studied history and that is absolute nonsense. Number one, the people of Israel have history here that is documented by the Bible itself. It is, it is proven by DNA evidence that we were here. We were displaced by the Romans in 132. We have a right to be in our ancient homeland. That's number one. Number two, you call us a colonial power? Are you, in other words, you, now I get it. You're saying like, you know, the... The, the British and the French came into Africa and they took and that. And I'm, I'm with you there. That's not good. That's not right. That wasn't good for the people of Africa. But don't try and copy paste that on Israel. Half of Israel, the Jewish people, forget the two million Arabs that live in Israel. And I don't say mean forget them to forget them because they're part of the nation. I mean, let's not talk about them right now. Let's just talk about the Jewish citizens, seven million Jewish citizens. Half of them are Middle Eastern. Half of them came from Morocco, from Iraq, from Iran, from Yemen, from Lebanon, from Syria, from, from, all, from Egypt, from all over the Middle East. 
And by the way, why did they come here? Because once Israel became a nation, they began to be persecuted in their nation. Just the people of Iraq, if, I'm, if my memory is correct, uh, 130,000 Iraqi Jews came to Israel. They had to leave behind $30 billion in assets. In Morocco, it was illegal. There were so many Jews leaving that they made it illegal for Jews to immigrate to Israel. For five years, the Jewish people had to illegally, secretly, on boats that were not safe, come to Israel. And the last one was called the Agas, which sunk in the Mediterranean Sea. Everybody died. And that, and finally, world pressure caused, caused Morocco to change their position. Um, but colonial, a colonial power. So like what, first of all, what colonial force came in here to take over? Because it, it, again, I, I assume, you know, history, it was the Ottoman empire that ruled this, where I'm sitting right now, I am in Israel. It was the Ottoman Empire that ruled here for 400 years. In 1917, Great Britain took control. And yet yeah, that would be a colonial power if they made it part of Great Britain, but they didn't. They had a custodial ship. A custodial ship. Custodial? I don't even know what I said. Um, um, <laughs> they were given what was called the British Mandate of Palestine. But they, in 1946, they said, we're out of here. We're done with this. We want to get out of here. There was no Arab state here ever. Ever before the Turks, it was the Mamluks. There was never a. There's no. Again, you you probably know that if you're watching this, there is no such thing. Never was a such thing as a Palestinian state in this area where I'm at right now, in Israel, in any part of Israel. Um, Israel did not take this country from anybody. And 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 if you say, well. Still, they had no right to come here. Number one, the Jews started coming back in the late 1800s, and they purchased land through what was called the Jewish National Fund. They didn't steal any land. In 1936, the Peel Commission said, you know what? You know, now that the Turks are gone, Great Britain is controlling this area, let's cultivate an Arab state for Palestinian Arabs and a Jewish state for Palestinian Jews. But everybody was Palestinian back then. It was not a nationality. It was just a region of, of the Middle East. And the Arabs said no. The Jews said yes in 1947. On November 29th, 1947, the UN voted again on something called partition. To partition the land of Israel, which is now the land of Israel, into two countries, an Arab country and a Jewish country. Arabs said no. Jews said yes. And the next day, the Arabs attacked. On May 14th, the Arabs left, or rather the British left, and five Arab nations tried to commit genocide against the Jews who lived here, but they lost. They lost our war of independence. We had a few squirt guns and a couple barely jets. I don't know how we won that war, but we won by the grace of God. It was a fight for our very existence. They wanted to fill the Mediterranean with our blood. That was a stated goal. But I'm sorry, we won the war. We won our independence. And no, the next day we didn't say, you know what? Now that we have independence, let's build another state for the Arab people who just tried to kill us. One reason we didn't do that is because the areas that we would have put that Arab state, we didn't control. Who controlled it? Jordan controlled the West Bank. Egypt controlled Gaza. And you know, did anybody in Egypt or, Ga in, in, or Jordan say, you know what? This, that land, you know, West Bank and, 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 and Gaza, that, that belongs to the Palestinian Arab people. Let's create a home. No! No, Jordan annexed the West Bank and Egypt took care of, the, uh, of Gaza until 1967 when, again, I apologize, but we won the Six-Day War. So this guy, this lawyer from South Africa, referring to Israel as a colonial power. Uh, and, and how's that working for us? Are we growing as a colonial power? Are we taking more land? No, we give up land. Yeah, as you might recall, we had the entire Sinai Desert. We gave that back to Egypt in 1979 in exchange for peace. Why? Because that's all we have ever wanted, to live here in peace. We made a peace agreement with, with Jordan. We tried to help cultivate a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, but each time we got to the finish line, Arafat would say no. In 1999, Bill Clinton and Ehud Barak, Prime Minister of Israel, and Yasser Arafat came to an agreement. 
And it was a suicide agreement from us because it would have turned our border into about eight miles in certain places, you know, from east to west. But uh, Ehud Barak uh, uh, was going to agree to this and give them half of Jerusalem. If you go back and watch the, the, the news coverage, they were all chummy and Barak and Arafat are push, pushing, shoving each other and brotherly fun. And then at the last minute, Arafat says, no, not interested. And he goes back and starts the second intifada a, that, that cost the lives of thousands and thousands of his own people. And what did they get for it? Absolutely nothing. We have wanted peace. We've been willing to give up land for peace. And they're like, no. And one of the reasons is, is because terrorism is much more lucrative. I've reported already that the top three leaders of Hamas are worth together $11 billion. They don't have jobs. They don't, they don't have businesses. This is money that they have stolen from the Palestinian people. The money that goes into Gaza doesn't go to feed. Yes, people are starving. Why? Because they are building tunnels instead of feeding people. All right, let's keep going here. So no, the creation of Israel was not a catastrophe. And, and by the way, Mr. Lawyer from South Africa, where, where, where did you want us to go? You, 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 again, I'm assuming you're a smart person because you're a lawyer, but you do know that the Holocaust ended in 1945? Just three years before, where, where one out of every three Jew, uh, two, sorry, out of every three Jews in Europe were killed, murdered, gassed. Where did you want the survivors to go? Should, should they have stayed in Germany? Maybe they should have gone to Poland or, or, or to Ukraine or to... Where should we have gone? Nobody wanted us. Nobody was opening the doors for us. We came to our ancient homeland. We came back to Israel. And we rebuilt this country. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful country. Everybody who ha hates Israel and thinks that we're just this horrible people, you've never been here. You've never seen this country. You've never eaten with Israelis. You don't, you do not know what you're talking about. I have lived here for 20 years and I can tell you, tell you that the people of Israel are a good people, a peace loving people. And we are, we are surrounded by people who want to kill us. I apologize that we built a strong army. I apologize that we defend ourselves, but you know what? You could have had peace for the last 80 years. If you could simply accept the fact that we are not going anywhere. This is our country. We're going to stay here. We have a, a, a title deed that is written by God himself. But even with that, we, we would treat those among us just wonderful. If you would simply live with us in peace. But you haven't wanted that. Number, I don't even know where I'm at. I'm going to go with number four. Um, apartheid. Apartheid. That's what this fellow accused us of. Now, again, I, I understand if you are black and in South Africa, and if you lived through apartheid, that you would certainly not want that on any other people. When I look at the history of, of America, and I know that there was a, a time of not only slavery, but after that segregation, you, you had situations where blacks could not drink from the same water fountains of white people. That, that's disgusting. You had at schools that were segregated. Um, we don't have that. Uh, you have beaches that were segregated. In fact, I just saw a, a, on Wikipedia a sign from Durban, South Africa, that it said this, according to the law, da, 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 this beach is for white, the white race only. So I get it that you're sensitive to that. But we don't have that here. And you know what's worse? Is you didn't say merely that we are committing apartheid against the Palestinians, which we're not. They could, have, they, they could have had their own state. They're governing their own selves. They have their own police force. I don't know how. Anyways, but you said it was on both sides of the green line. If you know what the green line is, that is the 1967 borders. So what he's saying is that the 2 million Israeli Arabs, those are Arabs who live inside of Israel. He's saying that Israel is committing apartheid. You know, let me just ask you this. Did you, during apartheid, were there any black Supreme Court justices? I, I really don't know. I don't, I'm not an expert on South African apartheid, but I'm going to say no. I'm going to guess no. We have Arabs who are in our Supreme Court. What about doctors? What about lawyers? We, we have Israeli Arabs who serve as doctors and lawyers. 
What about beaches? I, I, I lived in Tel Aviv for 20 years and every Friday when I would go to the beach in Tel Aviv, um, there would be hundreds of Arabs uh, from Jaffa who were having picnics and cookouts in the grassy area right in front of the beach. And you know what? That was cool. That was fine. There was no sign up that said, this beach is for Jews only. So I don't know what in the world you're talking about. There is no water fountain in Israel that says, this water fountain is for Jews only. There's, no, I'm not telling you it's perfect here, but here's what I can tell you. Now listen to me. There are 2 million Israeli Arabs. And you know what? They're not running away. Those 2 million Israeli Arabs could live in Jordan. They, they could go to the West Bank. They could go to Gaza. They could go to Syria. I don't know why anybody would want to go to Syria, but they could go to Syria. They could go to Lebanon. They could go live in... There's so many Arab states. Saudi Arabia. Yemen. They could go to North Africa, Morocco, Libya, Egypt. They could go to any one of those countries, but they choose to stay in Israel. Why would they choose to stay in a country that is apartheid, that, that, that separates from them, that discriminates, that hates them, that, that they have no free? Because maybe it's not like that. You know what? They have passports that, that says that they're a citizen of the state of Israel. They can travel. They have freedom of speech. Oh, by the way, in South Africa, did you have black people that were in your government? I'm going to say no, right? I, I, I bet somebody sent me an email if I'm wrong, but <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that under apartheid, there were no black people in high positions of government. If, if it, any positions, we have Arab parties in our Knesset. Sometimes as much as 20% of our Knesset is, is Arabs representing the 20% of Israel that it typically does not get that high. Uh, Arab Knesset members, and they say the most horrible things about the state of Israel, and they don't go to jail. They, they accuse, of, uh, accuse us of all the things that you're accusing of. Not all of them, by the way. Some of them want to actually try and, uh, uh, and advocate for the people in their community. But some of them are just, they hate the state of Israel. They hate Jewish people. And they say it out loud. No consequences. Why? Because we have freedom of speech. We have freedom of religion in Israel. I can, I can speak against our prime minister. And I have. I am... Not a fan of the current prime minister. But you know what? If I say things about him, no one's going to arrest me. So no, this is not um, an apartheid country. Yes, our government used um, speeches to motivate our soldiers. They played videos of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, Defense Minister Gallant, uh, encouraging the, the soldiers. And I don't know if you understand, but this is a war. The, wars are not pretty. Did you ever see Braveheart? Can you imagine, you know, the, the main character in Braveheart, played by Mel Gibson, getting up there and William Wallace, you know, getting up there and saying, now we're going to go to war, but, but uh, I don't like the face pain. I don't like the face pain. It's a little bit too violent for me. No, you're fighting for your survival. They were in that movie. They're fighting for their survival. Israel is fighting for her very existence. There is no other nation in the world that has been persecuted like the state of Israel. Not in modern history. More UN condemnations, resolutions passed against Israel, not only than any other country, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, more passed against Israel than all other countries combined. How can that be? We're a tiny little country of, of 9 million people, and yet the whole world is talking about us every single day. We're in every newspaper all the time. We're fighting for existence. So yes, when our commanders are out there and encouraging our soldiers to be brave and to fight and to risk their lives for me, yes, they're going to say things that you might not normally say. But you know what? Compare that with October 7th. I wish you would have, and maybe they will tomorrow when, they, when uh, uh, the, the Israeli team gets to defend themselves. Uh, but compare that with October 7th, with the hundreds of hours of recording of, uh, of Gazan Hamas terrorists rejoicing 
over the murdering of Jewish people. What they did on October 7th in those small communities, that was genocide. You take the community of Near Oz, where in one day, a quarter of their entire kibbutz, their entire community, was either murdered or taken into captivity. I watched a, a video today where a bunch of parents and, and siblings, they went near to the border of Gaza and they took loudspeakers and they began to cry the names of their children, hoping that maybe somehow they could hear them in captivity. What Hamas did on October the 7th, that was genocide. When you come in and you just mur and, if, and, and you say, well, no, because they only killed 1,200, they would have killed everybody. If they could press a button and kill everybody in Israel, they would have done it. So absolutely, it was attempted genocide. If they, would have, if they could have continued to kill more people, they would have. In Israel, yes, we're bombing Gaza. Yes, innocent people have died as in every war. Go look at any war. Go look at Syria in the, in, you know, from 2011 onward in the civil war. Go look at Iraq, Afghanistan, innocent people die and it's horrible. It's sad. War is horrible. But what army drops leaflets and says, please get it out of this area because we don't want to hurt you. We're going to be bombing this area. What army telegraphs their next move? That's what we do. What army opens up cor uh, corridors for safety to help give? I mean, there is tons of video out there of Israeli soldiers giving water to the people of Gaza, giving food to the people of Gaza, giving medical attention. Is it our fault that, that, that Hamas has turned their hospitals into headquarters? That they hide between, behind grandmothers and babies? That they hide in schools and in houses? It's not our fault. But what we can't do is what they want to do. We say, Ron, they would never do. They, they've learned their lesson on October 7th. No, they have not. Their top leaders have said, we will do October 7th again and again and again until there is no more Israel. What do you want us to do, South Africa? Hamas is the leadership of Gaza. They're hiding underground. They are risking the lives of their people. What do you want us to do? All right, lastly, what do we got here last? Well, I could go on and on, but, but I'm not. I'm going to stop right here. Um, I just want to cover some of the major points from today, and I'm praying for our team uh, tomorrow, uh, led by former Supreme Court Justice Aharon Barak, uh, 87 years old. That's who we're putting up to defend Israel, a guy who is 87 years old, but he's a legal genius, um, and his team. Uh, uh, Lord, we pray for them that they will be sharp, that they will do your will. And, and as I'm praying, I'm thinking, you know, I know what the scripture says. All nations will turn against Israel. Psalm chapter two, why do the nations rage? They rage against God and his Messiah on verse four, his holy hill in Zion, that the, the world is going to hate us more and more. I mean, listen, the anti-Semitism that you see today, you could not have imagined in September. I couldn't. I knew what the Bible said, but I could not, I couldn't fathom a scenario where it would just be so free and normalized in places like Harvard and, 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 you know, on the streets of London, but that's the world we live in. That's the solace I take every day. I wake up every day and I think, thank God for God. Thank God that we have God and we have the scriptures and we know that there's a messianic age coming. You know, I'll, I'll continue to use my voice to be an advocate for Israel, but my hope is in the age to come. My hope is in the return of Yeshua the Messiah. That's where my hope remains. And I know that God is a God of justice. I don't claim for a minute that Israel has fought this war perfectly. If you can find the army that has been just absolutely perfect in war, I'll give you a cookie, but you're not going to find it because it's, it's, it's dirty. It's horrible. It's messy business. And we don't want to be in this war right now. 
but it's what the world wants for us. So God bless you all. Thank you for listening. Shalom from Israel.